you'll be managing rental properties like a pro before you know it. Hi, I'm Soli Cayetano, also known as Lattes and Leases on Instagram, and I'm here with a veil to share the basics of becoming a landlord for the first time and what you should know before you get started. Let's start with the basics of becoming a landlord. Step one is registering your rental property. Many can agree that buying your first rental property is the first step to becoming a landlord, but there are other steps to complete as well, such as checking landlord-tenant laws to determine if you'll need to register your rental property or get a rental registry. A rental registry is when you register your rental property with the city to get approval on renting to tenants. If you need a rental registry in your city, prepare to submit information on the property and yourself as a landlord. Failing to do so can potentially result in costly fees and violating local landlord-tenant laws, thus impacting your rental business. So make sure you check to see if it's required before searching for tenants. Step two is tenant screening. Once you are ready to find your tenant, establish screening criteria that abides by fair housing laws. I typically look for a reliable income source which will comfortably cover your rental amount, positive past landlord references, their credit score which can show a history of payments, and a clear background and eviction history, although specific roles can vary per state. This ensures that the tenant has a good rental history and has sufficient income sources to continue to pay rent. Also remember that you're running a rental business and the best way to protect you and your property is by having an intentional screening process that can help you find tenants who will pay rent on time, take care of your rental property, and have great communication with you as the landlord. Find the best tenants for your property by requesting rental applications from prospective tenants. Supplement your rental applications with screening reports like background or credit checks to get a comprehensive view of each prospective tenant. Before doing so, check legal requirements and restrictions tied to screening rental applicants as they can frequently vary per city and state. Step three is lease agreements. Another way to protect your rental is by having a state-specific and lawyer-reviewed lease agreement in place before handing over keys to a new tenant. Your lease agreement should outline locally required information and additional clauses that let tenants know exactly what's allowed and what is not allowed and how to navigate certain situations like subleasing. I can say from experience that one of the best ways to minimize the chance of dealing with stressful situations is by having a lease in place that is legally enforceable and covers all of your bases. But make sure only to include information that you're comfortable with enforcing for all of your tenants to avoid discrimination and not intended to scare tenants. Some examples of clauses in avail leases include rent clauses, jointly and severally liable clauses, lease charges, security deposits, possession clauses, condition of premise clauses, use of premise, limitation of liability clauses, holding over clauses, renters insurance requirements, conditions affecting habitability disclosures, lead paint, radon, mold, and asbestos disclosures. Two additional clauses I like to add to my leases are on pets and renewals. A pet clause will stipulate that no pets are allowed in the rental unless there is a pet deposit paid and additional pet rent. That way a tenant will have to alert me if they plan to add a pet onto the lease. A renewal clause will state what will happen when the lease ends. Sometimes leases will go month to month after they expire or you can predetermine an increase at the renewal. This clause can also outline how much notice a tenant has to give if they plan not to renew their lease. This advance notice can really help with planning if you have to prepare to release it. It's also important to note that states vary whether or not lease agreements have to be in writing or oral for a set time frame. So make sure to check with your state to ensure that you have the right documentation to protect both you and your tenants. Step four is rent collection. Let's talk about the good stuff. The primary way you earn passive income on your rental is through rent collection which is why it's important to have a process in place to make it as easy as possible for your tenants. You can use a generic digital payment service to collect rental fees, but most platforms offer little payment protection and can generally have policies against collecting real estate related transactions. These platforms can also make it hard to track your rental income for multiple properties and receive the proper documentation to file your taxes. It is best to use a rent collection app that allows tenants to schedule rent payments in advance receive automated rent reminders, 
and help keep track about rental property accounting. Some of these services can also provide a 1099 form to help you properly report your rental income to the Internal Revenue Service, or IRS. These platforms also make collecting security deposits easy and provide payment confirmations to tenants to notify them of where you will store their payment for the duration of the lease. It can also help avoid commingling security deposits with your personal assets and accidentally using them for personal uses, which can be illegal in most states and often result in a lawsuit. Now that we've covered the basics of becoming a landlord, I want to share some tips I wish I knew when I first started. The first tip is to avoid becoming friends with tenants. While having a good relationship with your tenants is important, that doesn't mean you should become friends with them. This can make it a lot harder to enforce lease violations, uphold the terms in the lease agreement, and avoid emotional reactions to their actions. It may also increase the chance of landing in a tough situation requiring you to hire lawyers or take legal action to resolve it. The second is trying to be too invested in the property once tenants have moved in. If you've screened your tenants, you've most likely determined that they meet your criteria and will take care of the property. It's important to remember this once they've moved in. Be mindful of how often you visit your tenants without giving any kind of notice or how frequently you perform property inspections. Overdoing these activities can potentially violate the renter's rights and prevent them from settling into their property in peace. My third tip is to be prepared to handle maintenance issues or repair issues. One of the biggest challenges tenants experience is having a landlord who does not address their maintenance needs immediately. Even if a problem doesn't seem like a big deal to you, it is your responsibility as a landlord to address maintenance items that can impact a person's renting experience. Just because you're not living in the property does not mean that you're not responsible for taking care of the exterior and interior of the rental. You may also want to avoid allowing tenants to conduct maintenance or repairs themselves, especially for larger issues such as plumbing or cosmetic issues, since there's a chance that they may not do as good of a job as a professional. And my last tip is to research security deposit laws before collecting them from tenants. There can be a handful of laws regarding security deposits that dictate how much a landlord can require, if receipts need to be provided, and where they're stored, and so on and so on. To avoid mishandling a tenant's security deposit, research local landlord-tenant laws to know what documentation you need to provide tenants, where to store a security deposit, how to properly deduct relevant costs from the initial amount, and when to return it to avoid costly penalties. If you haven't noticed by now, the more familiar you are with landlord-tenant laws, then the easier it is to avoid violating them and landing in sticky situations with your tenants. You can typically type your state and landlord-tenant laws on platforms like Google for more information or visit the Avail Legal Directory for a breakdown on the different laws for each state. However, if you're unsure on what rules and regarding a certain topic, it's best to work with a lawyer for legal advice. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching this video. Becoming a landlord for the first time can be daunting, but the more information you know on the basics, the better. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to this channel for more videos on landlording, the rental market, and more. You can also visit avail.co or check the links in the description for educational articles and tools to help you manage your rentals like a pro. To connect with me, follow me on Instagram at lattesandleases for more. Thank you again and can't wait to see you next time.